Um, so just quickly to introduce myself, my name is Michael Kleiman. I'm the founder and director of Media Tank Productions, which is a production company in New York. Uh, we do film and video almost exclusively around policy and social issues. Uh, we do independent film projects and we also work with think tanks, uh, nonprofits, advocacy organizations, basically anyone working on policy. Um, and uh, the company is based on research that I did as a graduate student looking at how think tanks are using video, how they could use it more effectively. So I might uh, refer to some of that research throughout. Um, so yeah, this is, use, this is an intro webinar to using video for policy research. Uh, we're gonna keep it pretty high level, basic questions overview to get you sort of thinking strategically about one, how video can help you, when to use it, and then some strategic questions. Um, I will be doing, if this interests you, I will be doing a more in-depth course in September, which will be two webinars with a um, project that you'll work on yourself. So if you're interested, you can learn more about that. And I know on Think Tanks will be following up with some uh, information about that after the webinar. So just to tell you a little bit uh, about the plan for today, for the next hour, um, First, we'll, we'll look at a little background, a, a very general question of why even have this conversation at all? Why, why talk about using video in the, in the research and the policy realm? Uh, then if I can convince you it's a conversation worth having, we'll look at what video is particularly good at. What are the situations where you may want to consider using video? And then if I get you one step further to thinking, yeah, video is something we should be doing in a particular situation, uh, we'll walk through some strategic questions, some general questions to think about as you get going on a project. And then we'll wrap it up with a case study, a project called We Have Rights, which I, I just launched uh, in partnership with a few organizations back in April. And hopefully that will bring tie together some of the questions. Um, I'll have some chat uh, breaks, question breaks throughout. There is like a chat screen where you can just throw your questions in anytime you have them. To be honest, sometimes it can be hard for me to follow those as I'm going through. So if I don't get to your question during the presentation, feel free to use the chats to ask any questions, whether it's relevant to the, the question I've lined up or not. So let's start there. Um, why, why be talking about video at all? Why, why should think tanks be thinking about using video? For me, it comes down to a few things. The first is, the way I think about it is the world of public policy is very much a systemic world, right? It's a world of large data sets, lots of numbers, and really thinking about problems from a very high systems level. Um, and that's great, and that's very important for understanding you know, the deep-rooted symptoms of the causes of problems, the effects that different programs and solutions have, but it's not particularly good at moving people and inspiring them. People are inspired by stories about individuals. So the way I think about it is, up here, you have this sort of big, high-level policy world with all these different data points. And what you want to be able to do is zoom in on a representative data point and tell the story of the problem or the solution you're working on from the perspective of that data point to win people over. And it's, it's not to say that the individual stories should replace the big data. It's just that these two worlds can complement each other depending on the audience you're speaking to. So that's, I think, a really important point to take away from this is that None of this is to advocate for a lack of a systems thinking. I think that's critically important, but it's just about being able to complement the two worlds and, and use each to communicate what you're working on. You don't have to take that from me, right? So this is a, a picture of Daniel Kahneman, who some of you may know, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist who was one of the founders of the field of behavioral economics. And uh, Daniel Kahneman spent a lot of his career, about 10 years, looking at what sort of numbers, what sort of evidence could he present to decision makers, to policy makers, to get them to change their mind? Uh, and he did a lot of research on uh, how you could frame certain evidence and, and move them. And he found after 10 years, he gave up on that because he found that it was, it was pointless. Uh, the only way to get someone to change their mind was to give them a story and to figure out how you can couch your evidence uh, within a story. Because that's how we sort of organize our world. Um, when, when evidence, when, a, when we have a counter story that challenges our original story, I think that's how you get people to think differently about a problem. Uh, another reason I think this conversation is worth having 
is what I like to call the, the World Bank problem, right? So this, uh, this came from research done by the World Bank back in 2014. The World Bank, uh, they put out about 300 research reports every single year. They spend on average about $50 million a year on those reports. Uh, so they have quite a bit of stake in making sure that the research that they're doing gets out into the world. So back in 2014, one of these 300 reports they did, they decided they would look at the traction they were getting from their reports. And at the time, um, the research that they did was mostly available in the form of downloadable PDFs on the World Bank website. And the results that they found, uh, they looked at uh, 1,500 rep reports published between 2008 and 2012, and they found a third of them, a little over 500, weren't downloaded a single time. They found that more than 70% were downloaded fewer than 100 times, and then looking at another metric, 88% of them had zero citations, right? So I think, the problem of this is really encapsulated really well in a, um, an article about this report that was put out in the Washington Post. And the headline was, the solutions to all the world's problems may be laying in a pile of PDFs that nobody reads, right? So I think this is a really great way of thinking about an important reminder that you need to think about how you're getting your research out. And increasingly, um, video is a really powerful way, stories told through video is a really powerful way, uh, depending on who the audience you're after. So before we get into a little bit of that, let's pause for a minute. Uh, I'd love to hear, and we'll see if we can get the chat working, but I'd love to hear from any of you uh, whether or not your organization has run into this World Bank, Bank problem, how you've sort of tried to deal with it, and whether any of you have tried using video to date and, and what sort of results you've had from that. If no one has any, no, if nobody has any questions or, or stories from there, we can, we can move on. Um, I'll give you one more minute. Any questions at all on the, on the first, first couple? Annapurna has used video. How has that gone for you? Great, so people thinking about using beyond, going beyond PDF, um, some the Yes Bank competition. Okay, great, so it sounds like a few of you are, are at least thinking about this. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, getting the right length is hard, says Lydia. Yeah, the length can be a challenge, and it's really, I, I don't think there's like a precise length that is correct, it's all about, um, engagement right if, if what you're if the story you're telling if the if the thing you're creating is powerful length matters less uh, certainly depending on the platforms that you're using uh, social media tends to favor shorter pieces uh, whereas if you're on a, a media website it could be a bit longer on your own website it can be a bit longer so you know I most of the stuff I do tends to be in a three to five minute range but for social media you'll want to do a little bit shorter one of the things we'll talk about when we look at the case study and we talk about distribution is finding multiple uh, outputs that you can be doing creating to get people engaging uh, at different levels so there's not only one one option for reviewing what you're, you're putting out um, we can come back to that feel free to keep raising those questions throughout uh, let's talk about what I call cinematic value, right? So cinematic value is basically the things that video is uniquely good at. It's, it's the reason for using, once you decide we need to go beyond the PDF, as, as Lydia said, why video, right? It, video is obviously not the only non-PDF media out there. There's still photos, there's podcasts. Uh, all of these have, have value. I think video has certain things that it's uniquely good at. And those are the times when you when you have something that you think can create cinematic value, that's where I think you should really be thinking about investing resources and creating a video around it. So let's look at some of those, and these are broad categories, but let's look at some of those things. The first is to remember that video is an emotional medium, right? So you'll see a lot of times, um, and this is one of the things I ran into in my research, a lot of think tanks that will use video as an informational medium, right? So we'll, we'll have an expert who wrote a report 
and then we'll put that expert in front of the camera for a few minutes and let him or her talk about the report. Uh, that's conveying information, it's not conveying emotion, and that can get very boring in video. And it's one of the things when I spoke to policymakers about why they weren't using uh, turning to videos from think tanks, that was a common complaint, right? It was things I'd rather read. Uh, text is a great medium for information. And of course, there's really powerful ways of wrapping information up in video, and we'll look at that when we look at the case study as well, but you always wanna be creating an emotionally engaging experience with your video. That's what, that, what, that's what draws people to it. Uh, you wanna hit them first in the heart uh, to get them to think, with, you know, think about the information you're putting out. The other thing to keep in mind is, since video think tanks are often distributing their video online via social media, online sharing is driven by emotion, right? So people tend not to share things just because they find them interesting, they share things because they find them powerful, emotionally powerful. Um, so you always wanna be thinking about whether there's an emotional, uh, an emotional element uh, that you can be creating, and video has lots of tools for creating emotion, right? There's the stories themselves, there's the images that can be emotional, there's music, all sorts of ways to add emotional layers into your work. But I think you need to be thinking about that in order to create a successful video. And one important thing to, to keep in mind that a lot of researchers uh, and think tanks don't always think about, but humor can be a very, very powerful emotion, right? And so the, the still image I have here is uh, from a PSA that was put out by, a, I forget the city, but a, a city government in New, uh, New Zealand a few years ago on a PSA called Dumb Ways to Die. Right, and the goal of this PSA was just to get people to stand back on the metro so they didn't get hit by trains or they didn't fall onto the tracks. And they made this short little three minute animated musical with these little characters singing about stupid ways to die. The dumbest of which they said was to be hit by a, a subway. Uh, and you can see it got 100 million views online, right? That's pretty good for a PSA about trains. They actually made it Dumb Ways to Die Part 2, so a sequel to a PSA, which you don't hear about that much. And that's all from taking advantage of emotion, in this case humor, but a lots, lots of emotions can be very powerful. Um, the second really powerful value that's, that video or any cinematic form can add is storytelling, right? Visual storytelling. And here is where I, I think about telling stories about people, right? That's what we talked about the systemic level, and then down here, the personal, the story level. So how can you zoom in on a single story uh, and tell, tell the, the tell, expose viewers or show viewers the problem, the solution you're working on from that person's eyes, right? So finding characters that can serve as, as our, other tour guides or empathy channels um, in those worlds can be really powerful. Uh, and remember, because video is a, is a visual medium, you want to be able to show these problems or show the impact that these programs are having on people's lives rather than just asking a viewer to take your word for it, right? So if, if the problem is something about the impact of having a lack of clean water can be on, on a, a community's life, don't just tell me that's a problem. Let me experience that problem through the stakeholders, through the people in that community who are, who are experiencing it. And I think a lot of the, the think tanks and the researchers I work with this is where people tend to get hung up a little bit. They say, you know, well, my, the issue I'm working on doesn't really have an obvious person to tell a story about. And I think, to me, public policy is inherently about people, right? Every policy problem is only a problem because of the impact it has on someone's life. Every, every good solution is only a good solution because of the change it has on a person's life. So there are always people here. You may have to dig a few layers further depending on the issue you're working on, but how can you find those people and, and try to get into their world a little bit? Um, and then the other thing about storytelling is not only do I think it's just a powerful way to engage an audience in video, um, stories, especially within a policy audience, have very have innate value, right? So from a lot of the policymakers I spoke with, they talked about you know, research from think tanks being valuable, but they also have their own channels for research, right? Especially here in the US, a lot of policymakers, and I'm sure around the world, have access to other forms of uh, information, other resource, resources that oftentimes they'll trust, but they don't have what they 
they don't have is stories, especially stories from the ground, right? So take me to the field is something that I heard a lot. What, what's the value that video can bring you? Well, show me, show me a unique perspective on what this problem looks like or what this program looks like in action, what, this, what the effects of this problem are on someone's life. So just being able to do that can, can be a very unique thing uh, for uh, policymakers and their advisors to see and take into consideration. But then you also wanna be thinking about, you have your audience, who's your audience's audience, right? Who do they need to sell on these ideas once they, once they buy into it? <clears throat> um, and so that's where, uh, where stories uh, can be really powerful in terms of being able to be repackaged, right? Policymakers can then take your stories, um, put them into their speeches, into their own communications, their own newsletters, and of course, uh, they can share them online with their audience as well. So by creating a powerful story and packaging it well, um, not only are you engaging viewers, but you're providing real value to policymakers and others that you're trying to engage. <clears throat> Video, obviously, is a, it's a visual medium, right? And, and that's something, again, that I think a lot of researchers or think tanks don't always think about, is what is the visual value that I'm adding here? Um, and that visual value can be in a lot of different forms, right? So uh, it can be a visual analogy. If you have something complicated, a really complex idea um, that you know, lives up here in the systems level and you want to find a, a clean way, an engaging way to express it, uh, visual analogies can be a really powerful way for people to engage with that idea. So this is a, a still frame from a, a video from a few years ago that I still think is a great example of this and holds up from the Brookings Institution. Um, based on a report they did about uh, mobility, social mobility uh, from the middle class. And they just used a simple visual analogy using Legos to demonstrate the difficulty and the lack of uh, mobility between um, <clears throat> between classes in the US, and that, that was really powerful. Uh, but taking people to the field, right, this idea of being on the ground is a really powerful visual uh, example of visual value that you're creating. Um, and then the other one that I would think about is, is less thinking of a, an analogy, but it's just thinking about how you can be providing visual stimulation to your viewer, right? So again, getting back to a classic example I think we see from a lot of think tanks is, I have this researcher who I want to put in front of the camera and let them speak. And that can be, sometimes that can be valuable. And we'll talk about places where that's valuable. But even then, just adding a visual layer, whether it's interesting locations and angles for your interview or adding on interesting and engaging B-roll and trying to find a, a, a rhythm, a visual rhythm to the piece can be really uh, an added way to just engage people, to keep them stimulated uh, and, and concentrating on what you're saying. <clears throat> so let's, let's pause again and see if we have any takers on this about uh, the question I'm putting out is research projects that you're working on or your organization is working on where you think that video can be particularly effective and what sort of cinematic, what sort of cinematic value could video provide in those circumstances? But again, if there's any questions on anything I've brought up, feel free to ask them now. Yeah, so Katie Murray brings up a very good question about um, video as a how-to practical guide. And I'll mention that actually soon, but I think that's a great way of using video. And um, I think about this in the educational training uh, story. And, and you're right, Katie, that that doesn't necessarily need a story, but I think, and, and actually the, the case study we'll look at is how stories can really add to that. Um, but yes, training and educational use of video is very powerful. And I find actually that uh, people who are using them, organizations that use video for educational purposes, are the ones who are most confident that the project was successful. Um, that's not to say that others aren't, but I think a lot of that has to do with being able to get in-depth and immediate feedback from users. But it's a great way of showing people and really being able to scale training projects. So I've worked with organizations, uh, the case study included, that we'll get to, that do a lot of training but because of a given circumstance or because their trainings are so good, uh, just need a fast way to scale them so they don't always have to be there. And video can be a really, really powerful way to do it. But I do think 
adding a story can be an extra layer of engagement for those and make them even more successful. <clears throat> um, right, so we're talking about an annual port report and you, you interviewing key personnel to get their thoughts. And I think that's a great use. I think one of the, the great ways of using video increasingly is multimedia versions of it, right? So where you have uh, a digital report where you can engage via all sorts of media, text, photos, but also video. Um, and here's where I, I think it's extra important to think about what is the unique value that video is bringing here, right? So just sometimes just having an expert say something that has just been written or could have been written won't be the most effective way if you're not adding cinematic value, right? Why is this particular portion of this report, of this annual report, this research report, why did we put this as a video as opposed to text, as opposed to photos? And I think that's where you should really think about the cinematic value. Okay, let's move on, unless there's any other questions. So, Let's, let's talk about strategy, right? So once you've decided that um, we've got this issue we're working on, this re research we're doing, video would add some value, we wanna produce something, what are the questions that we as an organization should be thinking about? Um, well, the first one is very basic, right? Should this be a video in the first place? And this is what I was getting into a moment ago. And for me, there's two general questions. The first is this idea of cinematic value, right? Why? Why invest in a video here? Because, you know, honestly, video can be a, an expensive medium to work with in terms of resources and time. So why, why create a video? Why, why, what's the cinematic value? In addition to the ones we just covered, I'll add two here, which is this idea of adding a personality, right? So with that, we often talk about the poster child or the, the, you know, the poster child for an issue, and poster is obviously a, a still image, right? So with video, you can go one step further and really add a, poster personality to your issue. And that's finding someone affected by the problem, affected by the, the solution or the program that has a personality that people can engage with. And that's a great, you know, they, they can care about that one person and then care about the greater issue through them. So an example of this, um, the first film that I made was a, a feature length documentary that um, followed the lives of survivors of four different genocides and mass atrocities, right? And so one of the things we, look, we thought about is, okay, how do you, if you're telling the story of the Rwandan genocide, right? That's almost a million people killed in 100 days. That's a very scale, right? That's up here. It's, it can be hard with people to grapple with that and really understand that in an emotional and compelling way. So we, we kind of zoomed in on the story of Jacqueline, right? Who is a, a survivor who lost family members, who was uh, just an incredibly, motivated and resilient person who's now a, an anti-genocide activist, right? So telling her story gave a personality to the problem, it added emotion, it added a revealing story, um, and engages people in a really powerful way. The other version, uh, the other uh, part of cinematic value, and Annapurna, this is where you might be able to, this may, may be uh, relevant for your report, is hearing it from the horse's mouth, I call it, right? So this is people inherent, there's value, I think, in being able to witness history from a, you know, from a very broad standpoint of it. You know, if you're, you're showing an event, highlights from an event, <clears throat> I think there is value in being able to hear the speaker make his or her point rather than just reading about it. You wanna see a speech often, you wanna see the real thing as opposed to just reading the transcript. So when there's something, again, loosely historical about a place and time that people want to be able to participate in, video can kind of simulate that experience. Um, then the other big question to be asking yourself is, uh, who's your audience, right? So I've spoken to researchers where their audience is really, you know, the issue they're working on is controlled by two or three policymakers, and those are the three people that they're speaking to. And in that case, right, having a meeting with those people may be a much more effective way than creating a video for an audience of three. Uh, so are there specific policymakers you're speaking to or is it a more general appeal? Um, and keep in mind, even when you're talking about policymakers, um, there might be, you might be talking to more than just the policymaker, right? If this is an external advocacy strategy where in order to get the policymaker to care, we first need to get the public to care, or it may be that the policymaker is not the person who we need to speak to, it's actually their staff, um, and how can we engage their staff? So it, it may be a little bit more complicated than that, but certainly you wanna know the audience you're talking to. And then the other point of the audience is, 
what's their, how old are they, right? Are, are they part of what I call the Google generation or the YouTube generation, right? So do they, when they have a question that they want to know the answer to, do they Google it uh, and read the answer? Or increasingly, more and more people, myself included, when they have a question they want to answer to, will YouTube it and watch the answer via, uh, as we said a moment ago, sort of instructional videos, right? So in those cases, if you're talking to a YouTube generation, just being in video format uh, can be valuable. Uh, and that's where those sort of, well, it's just an interview with the expert, that can add value because you're speaking to a generation that will get more out of it or is more likely to engage just because it's in video. But I still think you should be thinking about ways to add cinematic value to it, make it more visually stimulating. Are there ways to make this emotional? Because all of that will just add resonance to what you're doing. So you've decided it should be a video. Uh, what are your goals? What are you trying to do with this video? And, and then who's the audience that comes along with it? So this is from research that I did. These are sort of the four blanket goals or general goals I, I found that most think tanks that were creating video had um, and the corresponding audiences. And there's obviously a lot of overlap, right? Uh, sometimes you're, you're trying to influence policy and then, as we said, you have policymakers, you have their staff, you might have an external advocacy strategy. Oftentimes it's it's not about a policy itself, but it's more about shaping how an issue, uh, an issue is spoken about. And this is where video can be really powerful in terms of framing a debate. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this next. Oftentimes it's about raising the stature of a particular organization or researchers within that organization, building up an audience for them. Uh, and that's where I think you wanna be thinking beyond a single video, right? You wanna be thinking about serial content. How can, if I'm trying to raise the, the stature of an expert within my think tank, I want her to be on a, a channel on a regular basis so people can keep tuning in. I don't think one video is going to do it. Same goes for the organizational stature. It's about creating regular content streams that people can keep turning to. And then this last one is what we spoke about a moment ago, this idea of education and training, which because we covered it, I won't get into it more, but that is a very powerful use of video. <clears throat> so once you know your audience, the next really important thing to ask yourself is where are we going to reach them? Where does our audience live? Where do they engage with video? And these shouldn't be, you know, one, these aren't mutually exclusive, right? It, the more places you can engage audiences, the more effective your, your content will be. Uh, the most obvious, right, the most common is online via social media. Uh, I find a really effective use of video is at conferences, right? So whether you're hosting a conference on a particular issue or you're speaking on a panel about a particular issue, starting with a short, powerful video, story-based, uh, can be a great framing device. And I'm always amazed that when I go to conferences that start with a video on the issue, how many times throughout the entirety of that conference, that video or the story in that video is referenced by people across the panels, right? And that just goes to show you the power of the frame, giving people a common reference point. And I think that's because people want, you know, they want those individual stories. Again, this is about repackaging your content. They want to use those stories to help make their point. So that's a really great place to reach your audience, especially a, a policymaker or an expert audience. Um, screenings or special events, right? So this is, this is different from a conference because this is about an event that is structured or centered around the video you've created. And it's oftentimes we'll start with a video or videos um, and we'll be followed up with some sort of uh, panel about the issue and the video that particularly. So I, I just participated in one a month ago, or a few weeks ago rather, for the uh, case study videos we'll be talking about, which we, there were four videos. We showed the four videos, it's about immigrant rights. So we had a panel after with myself, we had um, two legal uh, immigration experts, and then we had um, a representative of an immigrant, undocumented immigrant community in New York speaking. And it was a really powerful use of the video because the video, um, sparked lots of conversations that led to a really powerful, uh, lots of questions rather, that led to a really powerful and enlightening conversation. Um, training sessions, obviously, if you're doing training videos, um, and that's, you know, don't think, uh, I think, you know, there's, there's the videos that are meant to substitute for in-person trainings, but even those, when they're embedded in larger training sessions, right? So you have the basic training from the videos and an opportunity to engage with people to follow up on those can be really powerful. <clears throat> and then lastly, I think a less common use, but uh, sometimes used is 
within policy briefs or meetings with policymakers themselves. And this, I think, is really only worth doing when you have that really unique take me to the field quality uh, of your video, right? Because that can be a really powerful way to show the policymaker uh, the problem that you're dealing with or the program that you've been working on. Let them see it uh, in the field. Let them Give them a chance to go to the field virtually and that will oftentimes convince them of the argument you're about to make before you even have to start speaking. But I think the larger point to think about here is where you're engaging your audience, not only to start thinking about the way you'll distribute it and make it the most widely seen on, that, on those platforms, but also to be thinking about the context in which people will be watching this video um, or the multiple contexts, because that will, that will inform what you need to put in the video itself, right? If, if you know that people are only going to be seeing this sort of online and Facebook in a sort of blank slate where you can't control the context they're seeing it, then any vital information you need to make sure, or any information you want them to get, you need to make sure is included in the video. If you know they'll largely be seeing it within a special event or in a website that you control uh, within the context of a report, then you can give them the bare minimum, right? The bare, the stuff that, the, that where there's cinematic value and nothing else, right? And let the, the context in which it's being seen provide um, the other stuff that, that that media is good at. And then the next one um, is what story are we telling and whose story is it, right? And this is what we spoke about a moment ago is, okay, we're working on this issue. Where can we find those, the people who are affected by this, this problem? Where can we find the people who are participating in this program? And then go there and find them and let them tell the story. Let them, uh, not only let them tell the story, but spend some time walking around with them and let, and let your audience kind of see the, the, the problem, the program from their perspective. Let them see the impact on their lives. I think that's, if I, if I leave you with nothing else, and I know I've said this a few times, I think that is the most valuable thing, especially documentary style video can do, is it gives audiences an opportunity to see what you're talking about um, and, and engage with someone whose life is wrapped up in this problem or the program you're talking about. And that can be very powerful and is unique, I think, to video. Uh, video can do it far better than any other media that I think is out there currently. <clears throat> and then the last thing, which is far too often, I would say, overlooked, uh, is what's our plan for distribution, right? And this is oftentimes when I, I work with think tanks, I ask them about distribution, and it's, it's really not a concern of theirs. We'll get it out when we, when we get it out, but just make us a viral video and we'll take care of the rest. And what I'm trying to say is viral videos are not made, right? Plans for making a video go viral are, are thought out and put in place from the get-go. So you should be thinking about your distribution plan as soon as you start thinking about what the content you're making is. Because one, again, as we said, the platforms that you're distributing on are going to be wrapped up in, in the content you're making. But more importantly, it takes time and it takes real strategy. You wanna think about video, each video as sort of a campaign. Take a campaign mindset to the way you're distributing your video. And what does that mean? It means thinking about other organizations working on the issue that might be willing to partner with you uh, in terms of helping you get the video out. And what's in it for them, right? Well, what's in it for them is this repackaging, this repackaging aspect of, of a good story, of a well-produced video, is that they get to share that with their own constituents and their own networks. And that has value for them just as it has value for you in terms of getting your own content out there. Um, think about influencers within the space, whether they're policymakers, whether they're activists, whether they're celebrities who might be interested in this issue and can help you from the get-go and, and get, get them involved in production if you can. Um, multiple platforms, right? Creating content that can be distributed online, but also at events. Um, the case study we'll look at, we, we had radio versions of the, the videos that we were putting out, uh, obviously just the audio, but how can you, how can you hit people from multiple platforms, uh, multiple networks, and get your content out as far and wide? And then also, what sort of additional materials are you creating, right? And this is where I, where I said earlier, um, you know, if you have your main video, your story is three to five minutes, that may not always be appropriate, it might not be the best way to engage people. So what's the, the 30 second version or the 60 second version you can put out on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook to send people to the platform where they can engage with the rest. Um, people who have seen the full video, what other sorts of materials might they want to engage in after? 
um, what, my, what might they want to engage in after in order to uh, stay more involved in the issue you're talking about, to help with the issue you're talking about. And then with all the organizations who are helping you share this content, how can you make it as easy as possible for them to help you, right? So it's great that they want to support you, but they're, they're probably going to do the bare minimum. So think about ways that you can package uh, pre-written tweets and Facebook posts for them, give them all the content that they need, talking points, et cetera, all in one easy place that they can navigate and get it out. Um, and then obviously all of this requires resources, right? And this is where I think a lot of organizations, uh, they tend to think, all right, I know video is expensive, I want the best possible video, so I'm gonna put all of my resources into the production. Um, but then I make this great video, but it, it just doesn't get out because there's no resources for distribution. So I think a good rule of thumb is to think about splitting your resources 50-50, right? So as much as you're putting into production, you should try to put into distribution. And I know that that sounds like a lot to, to people, I think, when you first say it, but it means if you have $10,000 budgeted for a video, don't make a $10,000 video. Try to make the $5,000 version and spend $5,000 on the distribution. Because as long as you know what your goals are and who the audience associated with those goals, what, who the audience is, being able to be, have, some, uh, have energy focused and resources focused on getting the product in front of those, those audiences in a meaningful, impactful way in the right context is gonna go a lot further than doubling the production values of the video itself. Um, so don't shortchange the production, but make sure you're not shortchanging the distribution either. So really think about those two as like they go hand in hand in terms of the resources and in terms of the process. So let's pause. Uh, any questions on this um, about thinking strategically in terms of production and the distribution of videos. I know I, I just kind of threw a lot of information at you. To answer the question that was put out about the deck, uh, I know on think tanks uh, will be in touch afterwards and they will be sharing the deck. Um, and then I'll have my email address in the deck as well. So you, you can be help, you can feel free to reach out, out to me with any more specific questions. Um, <clears throat> do you have any advice for how to create engaging content with limited financial resources? Yeah, so this is, uh, I think, an important question because obviously um, most think tanks are, are nonprofits and in the nonprofit space, especially for nonprofits or think tanks that aren't used to doing video, um, finances are always a problem or often a problem. <clears throat> so I would say to, it, it, the, it depends on the context in which you're working, where you're working, how you're working. I think these sort of take me to the field stories, as long as it's easy enough for you to get to the field, uh, those can be done pretty cheaply, right? Um, those can be done if you find the engaging people and just spend some time with them, even in just like nugget size pieces. Um, if you can provide the context in other ways, that's great. A great example of this actually is, um, and we talk about it in the long course, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but it, it's, um, it's by, it was done maybe three or four years ago by an organization called Holla Back, which is based in New York. And they, were, they work on the issue of street harassment, right? So women who are being harassed on the street. And they made this incredible video for maybe a few hundred dollars where basically they just had a woman walk around the streets of New York for I think 12 hours or 10 hours. They followed her with a, a person who had a hidden camera and they just let people see the experience of street harassment, how it took place in the life of an ordinary woman sort of you know, dressed in regular clothes. And that's a great, and that went viral, got you know, tens of millions of views online, sparked here in New York, really important conversations within City Hall around local policy. So a really um, great example of a video done for very little resources where the effort was spent, one, on finding an engaging way to show people the issue, bring them to the field. And then they did do a lot of work in terms of distribution and outreach to press and all sorts of stuff to make sure that this content got out. Um, so that's a good example. But I think take me to the field generally is a good way to do things a bit more cheaply as long as you can get there. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to review this question.
So this question, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get the gist of it quickly, but it's basically a complex issue that they, it's, they're having a hard time breaking down to small bite-sized pieces to get people to engage, and they find the best way to have people engage is with expert talking heads. So I would, I would think about this a few ways, right? One is, <clears throat> can you, if this is a really long story and there's just no way to make it a short story, can you make it a story in parts, right? Can you, what I call kind of um, disaggregate everything together? So the talking head piece can be a 30 second or 60 second piece. The animated piece can be a separate thing. The story piece can be a separate piece, all available and within the context of the same page. So people can sort of almost choose their own adventure. Um, you know, what, what's most appropriate for them to engage? Is that possible? Um, is it possible, again, to put this in the context of something that does some of the informational work for you, right? So what's, what's the most important piece to express through video? And then can we provide some written or uh, still photos to express the rest of it? Um, I would think about if you are using talking heads, how can we make this the most visually interesting? Uh, again, this is whether it's B-roll or just finding like, you know, oftentimes you'll see interviews with experts that are just in front of a sort of logo of the think tank, which, you know, I think these days there, there's so much video content out there that viewers are, they just expect more. And so being able to find interesting angles that can just keep people's attention a little bit more, um, I think can go a long way for talking head videos. Um, I'm, not, I'm sorry if that's not a full answer to your, your question, but feel free to follow up um, with more specific, and we can talk more specifically about it. So let's get into a, a case study. Um, so let's get into a case study about, uh, this is a, uh, like I said, this is a campaign called We Have Rights that I launched uh, back in, at the end of March with an organization here in Brooklyn called Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, Brooklyn Defender Services is a pro bono legal service provider in New York, um, one of the largest in New York City. And in the case of immigration law, uh, they are the largest pro bono defenders of people facing deportation or other sorts of um, uh, trials related to immigration. Uh, so this is not a research case, but I think it, it is relevant, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I think we'll talk about why afterwards. But this was a case of trying to express a lot of information in an engaging way. So <clears throat> here's the problem that Brooklyn Defender Services, BDS, came to me with um, last March, right? So this is two months after President Trump is inaugurated in the U.S., there was a ton of anxiety within immigrant communities across the U.S., a lot of in misinformation about what, uh, what people should do when ICE or Immigration and Customs Enforcement stopped them or detained one of the member in their family. And BDS was being overwhelmed with requests from immigrant communities uh, for information, right? They often did these training sessions, these Know Your Rights training sessions, but they were just so overwhelmed with requests for them that they couldn't do their actual legal work of defending people. So they needed a way to mass distribute um, these sort of basic, understand what your rights are uh, when, when you're stopped by ICE in different scenarios. So I did um, a needs assessment looking at the space, trying to understand what content was out there already. And it turned out that there was a, a fair amount of content around Know Your Rights uh, for immigrant communities, but there, was some la there were some real gaps in that content, right? So there was a need for content that was available in multiple languages outside of just English and Spanish. There was a need for content that didn't require literacy, so people could engage with it and fully understand it, even, even if they couldn't read in a particular language. Um, and there was, we learned from speaking with our audience that the primary place that immigrant communities shared and got information was via social media, perhaps not so surprisingly, but we needed a way to create content that could be easily shared on social media. And so to me, as I said, that meant content that was particularly emotional or had an emotional aspect, which legal rights, right, uh, legalese language doesn't often have emotional language tied, or uh, emotional resonance to it. So what we came up with was this We Have Rights campaign, uh, which was a series of four animated videos that we did in seven languages around what to do in different encounters with ICE, uh, whether they stop you in your home, on the street, if they arrest you, four different scenarios. Our goal, we had two goals, two primary goals. One was to empower immigrant, immigrant communities to better understand their rights. And then the broader goal was to help the general public, American citizens, have a better sense of what was happening to immigrant communities in their country. 
So that kind of had two corresponding audiences, right? They had immigrant communities themselves who needed the information, and then a more general public, uh, people, like, right, a more outward facing external campaign. Um, and so to, to try to do this, we had the four videos, but we also, from the get-go, had a very robust distribution campaign where we recruited organizational partners and a lot of celebrity influencers to help us engage various audiences. Um, and we'll talk more about them in a moment. First, I want to watch one of these videos. So we created a microsite called wehaverights.us. Um, let me just see if I can hold on, sorry. Um, Need to do a new share. Um, great. Great. So you should be able to see now this is we have rights.us. This is the microsite we created. You can see there's this six other languages in addition to English that you can click on, some additional resources which you can speak about, and then the four videos uh, what to do when ICE is outside your door, inside your home in our communities or if ICE arrests us. So let's watch this one and then we can talk about it after. Samir's wife asked him to stop at the store on his way home from work to pick up groceries. While shopping, Samir noticed a man who seemed to be watching him. Was he paranoid? Probably, he thought. Samir's heart started racing when he saw a second man watching him outside the store. He moved deliberately toward his car, telling himself there was nothing to worry about. <laughs> I'm totally being paranoid, he told himself. That's when he felt a forceful grip on his shoulder. Without identifying themselves, the two men began to bark questions at Samir. It was ice. ICE stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Arrests like these happen every day, and they happen out of nowhere. It's scary, but remember, we have rights. If you are arrested by ICE, remain silent. Ask to speak to a lawyer, even if you don't have one. If you witness ICE making an arrest, it is your right to document what you see by taking notes or videotaping. Do not interrupt the arrest, but you have the right to ask for identification and badge numbers. If you've been arrested, do not sign anything. Keep whatever information ICE gives you. They will have important information for your family. After ICE arrests you, they will likely take you to an ICE office and ask you more questions before starting a deportation case against you and deciding whether or not to send you to a detention facility. Remember, do not say anything without a lawyer present. You can ask to speak to a lawyer even if you don't have one. Within about a day, loved ones will be able to search for your location at the website included below. This is all scary, but remember, we have rights. Be sure that you and your loved ones are prepared for encounters with ICE and that you have a plan for what to do if one of you is arrested, including information about who you should call. If you are arrested by ICE, remember, you have rights. Remain silent. Ask to speak to a lawyer. Do not sign anything. If a loved one is arrested, you should be able to locate them at locator.ice.gov. Okay, sorry, let me just try to get back. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's chat for a minute. Um, Talk to me a little bit about just some reactions. I hope you could hear that okay. Um, any reactions to the video itself in terms of um, the cinematic elements that you noticed that were used? Uh, do you think, and again, this isn't research information, right, but this was legal information, which can be just as dry as research information. Do you think, how did you see the cinematic elements being used to kind of make those more engaging? Um, and, or were they engaging, I guess? Were they effective in making them engaging?
the use of repet uh, yeah so right exactly what are the and this is also what are you know um what's the context that this was going to be seen right so this we knew was going to be in the con multiple contexts um online we wanted to get the most important information out but also within training sessions within the microsite we knew there'd be opportunities to get into some of the more detailed information elsewhere so what's the key information make sure you hit it uh, and and hit it multiple times even you know we realized the most important piece of information was many immigrants uh undocumented or documented in the u.s didn't realize that when they had encounters with immigration customs enforcement that they had any rights to begin with, right? So if they walked away with anything, we wanted them to understand that they do have rights, which is why the title of the video, right? We have rights. That's the, that's the most important piece of information to get out there. Keeping it simple and direct. So slow moving, interesting. Um, so I, I don't know, I, to me it's not a particular, especially slow moving. Um, I guess so, but you know, everyone's got different, different, uh, opinions on that. I think what we, and I, I don't know how well you could hear the music, um, but the suspense, suspense of the beginning. Yeah. So what we're starting to get into here is some of the story elements, right? Uh, let me, let me switch over to my slide. So our strategy here was to create, um, character-based narratives, right? So each video, there's four videos. Each one starts with a story about a person. So this is Samir's story, right? So we begin with Samir in everyday life. Again, we want to see the problem from Samir's perspective. You know, he's just going about his life at a grocery store, has this sort of nerve wracking experience, and then all of a sudden is being arrested. So showing that, uh, visually, engage, visually engaging through powerful imagery. Um, so the close-ups, but also just the, we took a lot of time in crafting what, what the images would look like. Um, we want to convey a lot of emotion, not only through the story itself, but again, I'm not sure how well you could hear the music, but we, we created an original score that was um, conveyed fear, conveyed empowerment, excuse me, uh, a lot of detailed sound design, so letting you kind of embrace, be part of the atmosphere he was in. Um, all the stories were tr based on true stories, so trying to show again, show the problem through, in this case, Samir's story. Um, and then, the last piece, which kind of brings us into the distribution, is we had celebrities narrate the, the video in all seven languages. So the person who did the English, whose voice you heard, is an actor named Jesse Williams, who uh, is an actor on a show called um, Grey's Anatomy. Uh, he's got a big following here in the US. Uh, in Spanish, we had a woman named Diane Guerrero, who's another um, actress on Orange is the New Black, uh, and a few other shows. But within the immigrant community that we spoke to, the Spanish-speaking community, she was one of the people that was brought up as a, a leader in the field on the issue. So one of the things that we did was actually speak to uh, our audience. We did a, a focus group with our audience prior to try to find out from them what would be effective and what, what sorts of information they need. Um, and then the distribution strategy. Um, so as I mentioned, we had celebrity influencers who not only voiced the video, but we engaged them to share it after with their audiences on Instagram, on Twitter. That was hugely helpful. We recruited organizational partners, everyone from the ACLU, who is a major partner, to Immigrant Defense Project, Human Rights Watch. We had lots of partners who were sharing the videos, both online, but then are also using it uh, in offline screenings and training sessions. Um, and then, like I said, we want to make it easy for them to share, right? So we created a social media toolkit that had sample tweets, sample Facebook posts, sample Instagram posts that they could use. We created a series trailer, so um, maybe you didn't, there, it was hard to get people to engage with the full three minute video or certainly all four three minute videos on social media. We created a one minute series trailer that would get people to move to the microsite, uh, a series poster. Um, one thing we did was we had a, a tweet storm upon the release. So a tweet storm is just basically a set period of time, in our case it was two hours, where you're asking all of the partners who are working on the, on, the, on the campaign with you to share on Twitter during that time using the same hashtag. And that's really helpful in terms of giving people, it, it, it shrinks the asks, right? Will you share this between one and three o'clock on Tuesday is a lot easier than will you share this throughout the week. It focuses the mind a little bit. And then it concentrates the social media activity, which uh, gets you more engagement on Twitter. Um, we had a major media partnership with Now This. So Now This is a big publisher on Facebook. And because Facebook was one of our primary uh, platforms where we knew we needed to engage our audience, that was a huge partnership for us. 
We created the microsite that I showed you that had additional materials like creating, you know, we talk about creating an emergency plan uh, on the microsite. You could download your own emo uh, emergency plan. There were links to additional resources to learn more about your rights. Um, and then we had multiple distribution platforms, right? Like I said, microsite, social media. We, we created radio versions with just the audio that we, we put out on audio, offline screenings. Uh, service providers are using these in their waiting rooms. Schools are using them in their classrooms. So we thought really strategically about all of the ways that we might be able to get our two primary audiences to engage with this content. Uh, and then just quickly, some of the results. So on our online launch, we had 3 million views on social media. Uh, really importantly, and I, I, I attribute this to some of the engagement uh, and the cinematic value we created with the videos themselves, 85% of the viewers who watch it on the microsite, which is the only uh, stats I have access to, they watched until the end credits, which is pretty, uh, really high in terms of long-term engagement. A lot of times you'll see really quick drop off after the first few seconds. So by creating this story from the get-go and all these uh, cinematic elements, I think we're able to keep people's attention. Uh, the We Have Rights hashtag was trending on Twitter when we launched, so that was, I think, as a result of that tweet storm I mentioned. We had 100 organizational partners, uh, lots of media pickup. In addition to the video launch, we had strategic radio use on uh, a radio network called Radio Campesino, which is a Spanish-speaking radio station in border areas. Uh, Mandarin-speaking station in New York played it on loop throughout the week of launch. Um, and that's continuing to be used in screenings of, and trainings and whatnot uh, by everyone from the Mexican consulate to human rights organizations. Um, so we all saw this as a really successful campaign. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, so I wonder if there's any comments on the distribution here or any general comments you want to throw at me before we go. Did we have a Twitter account for this? So that's a good question. No, we did not. Uh, Brooklyn Defender Services was the main Twitter uh, account that we used, as well as ACLU, which was another major partner. We just had the We Have Rights hashtag, and that was part of, that was strategic. I think um, one of the reasons for doing that and also doing the microsite was We Have Rights.us, right? It wasn't part of BDS's own website, and that actually made it a lot more attractive to uh, partner organizations to share, right? To be a part of something that wasn't so heavily branded Brooklyn Defender Services or ACLU, right? The Brooklyn Defender Services, I cut it off before, but they had their logo at the end, but that's really it. Everything else is sort of we have rights branded, which makes it a lot more easy for organizations to get on board. They don't have to worry too much about promoting a particular organization. They're promoting the cause and the information more. Um, editing software. Uh, so I use Adobe Premiere, which is more of a professional software. Uh, most, if you're using Macs, they come with, um, what is it, iMovie, that's actually fairly powerful for basic, um, basic editing. So that's a good question from Katie about, um, do we have to update the video content? Um, so fortunately or unfortunately, these sort of, in this particular case, uh, these, these legal rights aren't changing anytime too quickly. These sorts of rights are staying up to date. Um, so we don't, we're actually, we're changing it, we're updating in terms of adding more languages. So right now we're actually working on uh, Portuguese and French to add to the original seven. Um, but no, there, there weren't much information we had to do. And, and that's a good, that, you know, ha video is expensive and it's an investment. And if you're working in a field where your information is only, you know, if it's like an iPhone and it's only going to last a few months, you may want to think about a streamlined way of, of either using a different media that's easier to update or within the video using, so text is pretty easy to change, right? If you had just like screens with text that you could change pretty easily or swap out as things change. Um, I think the underlying stories, right? The underlying stories that I think should be the heart of your video is not, not likely, not as likely to change as quickly. If there is like specific information that may change quickly, you may want to include that in text uh, over images. And then that's pretty easy and inexpensive to change in a pretty rapid way. Um, great. So thank you all very much. I'll just wrap up with uh, reminding you that I'll be doing, if this was interesting to you, I'll, I'll be doing um, a more in-depth course in, sep in September that you can sign up for. We'll 
be doing one set. It's, it'll be two webinars, one specifically about production and one specifically about distribution, where we'll be going over best practices and strategies in each. Um, and they'll, you'll also have a, time, a chance to do an assignment to, to hone in on a project you're working on and try to apply it that I'll review for you. Um, and then if you have any follow-up questions, thoughts, ideas you want to run by me, feel free to. That's my email address, michael at media-tank.com. Uh, on Thank Tanks, we'll follow up with you with these slides if you want them. And yeah, I hope to hear from you. Thank you for participating and have a great day. Thank you all very much.